All right, well, good morning. It's a privilege to be here with all of you all this morning. And I just, first of all, just want to thank Chris and the elders at this church here at Grace Community Church for giving me the opportunity to share the Word of God with you this morning. If you'll stand, uh, go ahead and turn to Ephesians chapter 5. And if you'll stand, we'll go ahead and read our passage. Ephesians 5. We'll be picking up in verse 15. Therefore, be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time, because the days are evil. So then, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is, and do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation. But be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, to God, to God even the Father, and be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. Please be seated. Now, I'm no expert on war or military history, but one thing that I've come to understand is that when two nations are fighting together, one of the common weapons of choice that the soldiers and the platoons have to be mindful of are IEDs, otherwise known as improvised explosion devices. These are devices that are hidden beneath the Earth's surface, and they're typically detonated when a soldier drives over them in, a, in, the, in their vehicle or when they step on them detonated and then it could destroy the platoon, it could kill the soldier, severely injure them. It's especially common in the Middle East in places like, like Afghanistan and Iraq and our soldiers when they were there they had to carefully maneuver through this minefield of IEDs just to make sure that the soldiers for one remained alive but stayed focused on their true mission. We live out our Christian lives in a minefield. And although we're not carefully searching for IEDs and trying to navigate around them, we are to be carefully preparing ourselves each day to navigate through this sinful world that promises so much joy and satisfaction and fulfillment in the sinful activities that many in the world are engaged in. Our adversary, the devil, is very crafty, and he seeks to use the world's system to trip us up and to get us off course from the main mission of looking like Christ each day. So what we will see this morning as a result of this text is that the daily walk of the believer is a carefully observant, time-redeeming, deeds-driven, others-focused walk. And it is only obtained by being in the will of God and filled with the Holy Spirit. Again, what we will see this morning is that the daily walk of the believer is a carefully observant, time-redeeming, deeds-driven, others-focused walk. And it is only obtained by being in the will of God and filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, we've been in Matthew with Chris in the, on Sunday morning. So being that we're in Ephesians, I think it's right and good that we get just briefly some background information into this letter that we're in this morning. So Paul, the Apostle Paul, is the one who wrote this letter approximately between 60 and 62 A.D., and in writing this letter, it's written from uh, prison in Rome in order to express his inner satisfaction with the Christ-centered faith of the addressed and their love for all the saints. Another closely related reason for why this is written was to, was it to picture God's glorious redemptive grace toward the church bestowed upon it in order that it might be a blessing to the world and might stand united over against all the forces of evil and thus glorify its Redeemer. And so we're going to pick up today in Ephesians chapter 5, and previous in, particularly in verse 15. In the first 14 verses, he's talking about, Paul is encouraging them to be, these Ephesian believers, to be imitators of God. And then he gets into verse 15, and he gets into the specifics of how we ought to please God as to how our walk as believers daily should be looking like, what it should be looking like. So we're going to pick up in verse 15, and if you'll follow along with me, I'll read it once more. Therefore, be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise. So the first thing that we need to make note of is that there's a therefore. 
Therefore, here in this passage, it refers immediately back to the apostles' call for believers to walk as those who have been raised from the dead and are now living in Christ's light. This is in verse 14. It also even reaches further back to build upon his call for believers to be imitators of their heavenly father in verse 1. So Paul says, therefore, be careful how you walk. So the first thing that we'll see regarding the nature of the believer's walk is that first, a believer walks carefully. A believer walks carefully. Therefore, be careful how you walk. Careful has the basic meaning of accurate and exact. It carries this associated idea of looking, examine, examine, investigating something with great care. It also carries the idea of alertness. So he says, be careful how you walk. And walk is also a term that often is referred to as, here as daily living, behavior, living in a specified manner. And Paul wanted these believers whom he was talking to to be deliberately mindful in the way in which they walked every day. He didn't want them to be influenced by the world and the culture around them there at Ephesus, at the church that he's writing. And so he is encouraging them, be careful how you walk. Now, times are much different for us as believers today than they were for the believers that Paul was addressing there back then. But I think, in fact, there's much that still applies today. So we'll just take a few moments and consider how it is that we are to be careful as we walk. And with our modern world and society, there's much more distractions than Paul had in his day, in his day that we have in our day that we need to be careful of. So just right away, some of the things that I'd like you to be considering this morning is this. Are you carefully watching your life to see it, how it's being influenced by the people and places around you? Or have you just kind of allowed yourself to slip into a state of spiritual blindness and complacency? All of us as believers are supposed to deliberately be mindful and watch daily for, for opportunities where we could choose to disobey God or glorify God. And by God's grace and the power of the Holy Spirit, we need to be choosing those things that would please and honor Him. And I know that that's your desire if you're a believer and my desire to please and honor the Lord. But sometimes we can just think that because we've been a Christian so long or because we know so much that it's just going to come natural. But we have to be careful. And maybe you think that you've been careful, and perhaps I, I hope and pray that you have. But just as you've went through this week, and in case you've forgotten, might you be reminded of a couple of areas in, in your life and in mine in which we're supposed to be careful in. First of all, we're to be, and you can jot these down, these aren't on your outline, but these are just some areas that we'll consider briefly and looking at. First of all, in the workplace. Many of you are involved in a, in a job outside of this church where you're around unbelievers pretty regularly on a pretty regular basis. And if you've been there, like I have in that environment, for any length of time as a believer, one thing that you'll soon find to realize is one or two things is going to happen. You're either going to influence them for Christ or they're going to start to influence you over time. And so... That you, you start perhaps your job strong and as a believer, yeah, I'm, I'm committed. My, I have a zero tolerance for being influenced by others around me. But then as others approach you and as they say crude jokes or as they, as they, as they repeatedly over and over again say things that, that are not pleasing to the Lord, sometimes we can just get tired of the fight. Sometimes we can just allow the influence of others to influence us negatively as a believer. So might you consider in your workplace, how are you doing in being careful to walk as Christ would have you to walk? When others say, for instance, a crude joke, or when others come up to you and, and want your opinion on something and it's gossip, how deliberately mindful are you at making sure that you're taking those thoughts captive so that you don't dishonor and displease your Savior? Oh, another area of focus that we have to keep in mind is our friendships. It, it actually says in 1 Corinthians 15, 33, do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. We can be negatively influenced by others in the workplace, but we can also be negatively influenced by bad friendships in the company we keep. So our friends and 
one of the things that we have to consider with our friendships and those whom we hang around with is how are they influencing me as a result of hanging out with the people that I hang out with as a result of the relationships in my life that I have are they bringing me further and further along towards Christ's likeness are they friendships that are pleasing and honoring to the Lord or are they bringing me down are they distracting me from my main purpose and my main goal to honor my Savior J.C. Ryle once said, Nothing per perhaps affects man's character more than the company he keeps. So how are you developing wise friendships? And are you engaged in wise relationships as a believer this morning? Certainly it applies to both young and older uh, people, but I, I just want to encourage our teens in this as well. As you are learning and growing in, in Christ, be careful that you don't start to get negatively influenced by those who are not unbelievers. It, I'm not saying completely, obviously, abandon unbelievers, because that would not be very loving or that would not be very practical. But we are to be carefully examining how, un, how our friendships and how others around us are affecting us in our character. And are you carefully and continually watching your life to see how you're being influenced? So another area of influence that we need to be careful of in our lives is in our choice of social media and entertainment. As you're, scroll as you're scrolling and swiping and checking inboxes and watching on your devices, are, as you're doing that, are they drawing you closer to the Lord and then and influencing you for his glory or are are they bringing you further away for the lord are you engaged in something inappropriately that you shouldn't be engaged in because the whole idea here is that we're to be careful daily how we're living as believers we need to be careful of the music we listen to and the podcast that we listen to on our commute to work or in the house as we're working at home or on the way to school or whatever that looks like for you in your life so what about those things? Romans 12, 2 says, Do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Are the things that you're listening to, the songs, what are they teaching about God? And the podcasts that you're listening to, are they pleasing and honoring to the Lord? Are you starting to get engaged in, for instance, the things of the world in an, in an inordinate way? I love reading the news. I love catching up on what's going on in the world. But if that becomes an inordinate desire to where that takes the place of Christ in my life, I need to reevaluate my priorities daily and how I'm living my life. And another thing, and, and this is nothing against K Love, but there, I love listening to K Love. But some of the songs that are played on K Love, it's like, whoa, what was that? What did that say? I, I don't know what they meant by that word or that lyric. So as we're listening to music, I think sometimes it's easy for us to just kind of get along with it because it's on a Christian station or because we just regularly hear it. It's okay to, we just kind of get in this trance if we're not careful to always be alert. How is everything that you're taking in influencing you for Christ or? Is it influencing you further away from, uh, from, from Christ in a negative way? Other very practical area in which we're to be careful as believers is in our speech and conduct. And this, yes, includes our tone and expressions as well. As we're going about our daily lives throughout the week, other people are watching us because they know that we proclaim Christ. And so they look to our lives for evidence of that truth and reality. So how are you doing this morning at controlling your anger? When that person cuts you off or when that child does something that's displeasing to you and you know you ought to respond biblically but you didn't or when you, teen, disrespect your parents and say something that's, that's not appropriate because you think that your way is right and, and what they would have for you, the parents whom God has placed over you don't, don't know as much as you do. In our pride, you got to watch that. We got to control our anger. We got to guard against gossip and slander. That's another thing we have to be mindful of in our speech and conduct. We have to make sure that we're not either intentionally or unintentionally slandering others and gossiping against others, particularly, again, as it refers to the workplace. I, I don't necessarily find myself being having to be as careful as a testimony to the Lord here but at this church because there's not much of that that goes on that I'm aware of. And But when I'm in my workplace and when the day shift starts to complain and grumble about night shift, 
I have to be careful that some of my own thoughts on that don't start to come out in a sinful way. Well, yeah, they, they, they do need to do better, and that person really doesn't know what they're doing. And, and so, so quickly, if I'm not deliberately mindful, if I'm not careful, I can quickly fall in to that trap of giving in just and, and speaking just like the world, the unbelieving world. Another area of focus for you is nonverbal communication. So I mentioned your tone. Okay, what's your facial expression say when somebody does something to you and you disagree with it or, or you, you don't really feel like serving in that moment and looking more like Christ? You'd rather, instead of doing the dishes, helping your wife or helping your parents, you would love to just go and watch TV or you would go and just lo- like to take a nice hot shower and go to bed, maybe. So, and then they say, honey or sir, could you, put, or young man, young lady, whatever relationship that that in that context is like, whether it's a child to parent or husband to wife, could you please do the dishes? (sighs) Storming away, stomping away, right? Well, what does that just say? They maybe didn't verbalize anything by their tone and expression. They clearly demonstrated that that wasn't in their heart's desire and Therefore, that's a learning opportunity. Parents correcting their children or, or vice versa, the husband and wife relationship. You know, what you did wasn't very pleasing and honoring to the Lord. You might want to consider that. You might want to think through that. We, we are to be careful how we walk. We, we can't walk as unwise men. We have the full knowledge of God given to us here in Scripture. The last area that I'll mention just that we need to be careful in is our parenting. In our parenting, we need to be careful that our expectations for them are right and good. We have good expectations, but we don't need to go above Scripture or add to Scripture in, 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 in any kind of way by placing some kind of unrealistic, unbiblical expectation on them and exasperate them. We need to be careful in our parenting. We need to be careful in our parenting as we're instructing our children in the way of the Lord that we're not in either intentionally or unintentionally provoking them to anger or causing them to sin or helping them stumble by our actions. The Christian life is a life of carefulness. We're constantly to be examining our lives, comparing it to Scripture, and seeing where we fall short and need to please God better. Proverbs fourteen sixteen. A wise man is cautious and turns away from evil, but a fool is arrogant and careless. No loose living, guys. We are to be absolutely careful, deliberately mindful, on the alert all the time. Our enemy, the adversary, the devil, is very crafty, and he works with our... uh, our our flesh, our fleshly nature to, uh, to cause us to, to tempt us in ways that we, in which we need to be on the alert so that we can choose to honor God and, and go, go not into temptation and commit sin. No loose living. In First Peter 1.17, if you address his father, the one who impartially judges according to each man's work, conduct yourselves in fear during, your time, during, your, during the time of your stay on earth. So I ask you this morning, are you conducting yourself in the fear of the Lord this morning as you walk about, as you go about in your daily life? Are you, are, and, and it's a holy fear. It's, it's not, a, not like you're just frantic and scared, but I mean, you have reverence. It's a reverential awe of who God is. And is that evident in your life? You know, one of the things that became really apparent to me as I started working in my workplace, there's so much that goes on there. And, and sometimes when, when people say things that are displeasing and it's clearly sinful, then that we're around either if it's in the workplace, but it could apply to any other areas of life, is that when they say something that we know we ought to correct biblically, or we ought to say, I, I don't, I'm not going to participate in that discussion because for me that's sin. Where we need to stand strong and firm in our witness for Christ, sometimes we'll just brush it off by a quick laugh because we don't want the confrontation. It'll be a little bit awkward. And, and, you know, after all, we might be their boss or we might be someone of high influence in their life. And so we don't want to kind of have this awkward relationship after that. And so they say something that we know is displeasing and dishonoring to the Lord. And we're just... 
Well, just one of the things that we have to consider if we're doing that, one of the things that the Lord has taught me is that by my laughing it off, I'm by nature approving of it. They think that they might think or they might seem to think that I approve of that and they might misunderstand me. And I, I, of course, I don't approve of those things. So we need to be extremely careful because our mannerisms, our tones, and our expressions can accidentally portray the wrong message of what we want the watching world to see in our life as believers. Next, a believer walks wisely. A believer walks wisely, so the believer walks carefully. And next, we'll talk about how a believer walks wisely. Now, to live wisely is to live your life out by the accumulated knowledge or discernment that you have. And so, as believers, the way that you walk in wisdom is by living each day according to the principles and commands of Scripture. That is what you have. That is what, is, that, that is what God has revealed to you. And so you have the ability through the help of the Spirit to live out those principles and commands on a consistent basis. Though not perfect, because none of us are, you have the ability through the help of the Spirit to live in such a way that is, that is pleasing and honoring to Him. And so when I'm talking, another thing here is when I'm talking about living wisely, I'm not talking about just some kind of mere intellectual knowledge of, of something, like a factual knowledge of Scripture or like a factual uh, knowledge of just all the facts, but the way it's portrayed in, in, in Scripture. So not just a mere knowledge, but practically your life has changed. You don't just have a bunch of facts, but then your life's not changed. But in Proverbs 14, 6, again, a wise man is cautious and turns away from evil, but a fool is arrogant and careless. Another one is Proverbs 1, 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. And there's a few other passages that I could reference that, that I might just bring to light for your memory this morning. 2 Timothy three sixteen through 17. All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. God has given you everything in the full canon of scripture to equip you adequately for every trial, every decision, every every everything that you will face in your life. And you, if you're, you need wisdom this morning. I need wisdom this morning. There are so many areas in our lives where we need to make sure that we're living out biblical wisdom. You have in your marriage, you need to be living wisely. Husbands and wife in, in that relationship, they need to be husbands instructing their wives and wives graciously and submitting to their husbands. And, and as, as the husband and wife work through decisions for the children and family and things of that nature, you have to make well, uh, biblically discerning decisions. And so I just remind you of texts like this because I know, I, I know that you believe this, most of you here. But again, are you relying on your own in wisdom in any way, shape, or form? You have the complete scriptures when you have the complete word of God here that you need to make sure that you're remembering and putting into practice. You need wisdom as you work through family issues and provide counsel. It's so easy to just kind of say something that you, that you know or give your own opinion in some kind of critical situation and not think through biblically how to address it. And just because you just want to wanna get to that, you think you can just answer that person's question or solve that, that person that you know's marital problem or whatever kind of counseling situations might arise in your family if you're a family that... Uh, likes to work through that biblically if you're a believing family if you and then you need wisdom from God's word to make sure that you're that you're properly interpreting scripture and applying it appropriately in each and every situation so you need to work through some of your parenting issues that arise how to discipline and train and bring up your children in the way of the Lord you you need more than your own wisdom to do, to do that if you're a believer, because that should be your fundamental desire is to see your children come to the saving knowledge of Christ and your wisdom, your own knowledge isn't sufficient for that. You need to biblically live it out. And yes, with the knowledge that you have that you've obtained through study, bring that discipline and instruction to bear, but ultimately trust in the Lord for that. Again, I know this is probably true for most of you. I know these are common things. Perhaps you, you know these things. I'm not saying anything new, but again, how easy it is to just kind of put, 
put that on the back burner and just go off of our experience, we call it, or what we, what we already know. I already know the answer to that problem. I already know how to solve that, that relationship issue that my friend is in, and, and, and I can do that. So just be careful of that. Be careful of the pride and things that come along with that. So just a couple of additional questions for application for you this morning is, do you let God and his word dominate your thinking and actions on a regular basis? Do you have a zero tolerance level for any sin existing in any way, shape, or form in your own heart and life because you fear God and desire all, above all things to please him? This certainly is one major way believers can walk wisely. Additionally, don't fool yourself into thinking that you're walking wisely simply because you already know all these biblical truths. Don't fool yourself into thinking you know everything because you've went through quizzing year after year at Grace Community Church and you have all this knowledge. That may be true, and I'm sure you have much memorized passages to the glory of God. That's good. But just be careful that you don't get self-sufficient in that. Just be careful that... And again, I don't think that this is the attitude of generally here. I, I don't think that at all, but I'm just mentioning these things and, uh, that we need to be careful of falling into sometimes. Oftentimes, our own sinful pride blinds our eyes to the true wisdom of God, and, and we think that we know so much, again, maybe because of what we went through with quizzing or what we sit under in our SI classes or, wow, we really just went through a new members class. So now we know what a, what a, what a true biblical church looks like and all these other churches around us are unbiblical. Again, I don't think that's the tone here. I don't think that's what many of you think. But I'm just saying in our pride and in our own, in our own arrogance, we can, these things can arise in our own hearts. Well, Moving on, Paul goes on in verse 16 to mention some additional ways believers can honor God by walking in wisdom. And so we just finished discussing uh, verse 15. Therefore, be careful how, how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise. And so verse 16 says, making the most of your time because the days are evil. So one of the ways in which we can live wisely among many is we manage our time to the glory of God. And the phrase making the most of your time here means to utilize or to redeem, to to buy back your time. And so carefully considering how I'm spending my life, my time that God has graciously allotted to me as a believer is critical in light of the evil days that we're in. It says, we just finished verse 15, but he says, not as unwise men, but as wise. So in light of all these situations that you're going to face in life, in light of all these relationships that you're involved with, and all these things which you might, as a believer, have to provide counsel with, you need to properly manage your time in such a way that you could be of maximum benefit to the lives of others. You need to constantly create the space in your own life for managing your, your time. Well, Well, I'm too busy is often what we say. Well, oftentimes, maybe that means you might need to take something off your schedule. Or other times, I've, I've, I've went up to Chris a time or two, and you know he's mentored me and trained me along, and I went through the Excel program. I said, I'm, I'm too busy. He said, no, your, your busyness isn't directed properly. You need to structure and schedule your life in a much better way. And I'm like, ooh, thanks. <laughs> that was really helpful. And so, and he provided me with further insight as to how uh, I might do that. Now, I will mention one thing about scheduling and about to-do lists. Everybody has their to-do list. Everyone has their calendars. Everyone has their continual reminders on their phones. They have their systems and everything set into place. But here's the thing. Don't forget to look like Christ in the midst of all of that. It's so easy to create your to-do list. It's so so easy to create all these systems in place to where my time is scheduled for the next two years out or or my day is set for the next week or two weeks ahead and then all of a sudden you don't do any of it and so you wasted really all that time creating that schedule in the first place when you could have been spending time with your family or spending time out doing something else to the glory and honor of God so don't get caught up on the weeds in this properly manage your time as a believer we do that differently than the unbelieving world because there's motives involved that we're wanting to be of benefit to others for the glory and honor of christ that is how we truly manage our time it's biblical time management with with the desire above all else how can i how can i do good works of service today to bless others and and be a blessing and benefit 
Another thing that I just mentioned on time is don't think that time is your own. And don't think that time is your own. This applies to both believer and unbeliever because all time that man has on earth is time that has been graciously allotted to them by God. So don't think that time is your own. And it says in 1 Peter on the, on the whole idea of time is limited, just think in 1 Peter 1, 24 through 25, all flesh is like grass and its glory, all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers, the flower falls off, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this word which has preached to you, James 4, 14 says, yet you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. You are just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Just like the, like the fog on your windshield when you turn it on on a cold morning, it's just gone. You just turn on the defrost and just, it's just gone, right? And that's literally how time is like. And as I experience a one-year-old now in parenting, I'm ever and increasingly experiencing that reality. Time is quickly vanishing. We need to properly manage it in such a way that we're bringing honor and glory to our Savior. And, and another way in which we do this, we, we do it by managing our time, but by doing good works. It says, um, verse, making the most of your time because the days are evil. So in light of the evil days, we are to do good works that are pleasing and honoring to the Lord. In Ephesians 2.10, it says, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. Just an important distinction I need to make here about works. I'm not speaking about works, good works to earn your salvation. Salvation is not by works. I want to make that clear. I think that's um, clear. Most of you know that, but just good to remind us. But doing good works for the glory of God looks different to the world around us because everyone else just does good things for themselves or, or maybe some organization. But believers do good works because they've been graciously pardoned by God and desire to live in such a way that their life demonstrates the reality that they've been saved the, uh, to others. And so that is why we are zealous in good works. We're doing it as a result of our salvation, as a result of God working in my life in such a powerful way. I want to I wanna do good works and glorify him here, not to earn anything, but to please him and to be a blessing and benefit to others. We need to manage our time and, and doing good works, pleasing and honoring to the Lord in light of the evil days. This is another primary motivator, by the way, if you're a believer, for how you are to manage your time in light of the evil days. We manage our time in light of the evil days because unregenerate men and women use their time for evil. So because of this, the evilness of our times and certainly serves as a primary motivator. We live in a world that drinks down iniquity like water. People out there are mob bosses planning out murders or people involved in some scam or people spending their time in vanity and, and through partying and other things. And they're using their time that God has graciously given to them for evil purposes. We of all people as believers better manage our time in a way that's pleasing and honoring to the the Lord so that they can see what's really worth living for. Whether it's people who use their time, again, to do other things that are, that are not pleasing to the Lord or whatever the case is, we need to be the examples. The days are evil and people use their time for evil, and that should not be the case for the believer. We're not to be foolish, and we're not to use our time in a foolish way. That's what Paul's getting ready to say in the next verse. You know, I, I experience this usually every UT game. I, I work for Aramark, a food and beverage company on UT's campus, and I experience this every day, every game day at least, and, and particularly at night when I drive home. And I always have to drive through this street where there's a bar right there, and, and, and people are out there partying. And one time I literally saw somebody laying down on the ground in the middle of the road because they were so intoxicated. And I'm like, really? Is that it? Is this, is this really all of what life's about? You know, I'm just thinking into my mind that people out there are deceived, thinking this is how I can truly find meaning and happiness and joy in my life if I just go to these parties, if I just live it up, so to speak. People who blaspheme God, they live as though he doesn't exist. And so in light of all of this, we need to be the example so that we can truly make a difference and impact in, to the unbelieving world. Another way in which we go about managing our time and, and doing good works of service to our Lord is, is um, 
that we're not foolish. It says in verse 17, So then, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. So just something real quick on being foolish. In light of all of this, in light of what you know to be true, and you see this yourselves, not in your own in your own lives, how people foolishly spend their time in light of these evil days and the times in which we're living, in light of all of this, why, of all reasons, would you be foolish? That's kind of, you know, why would you choose as a believer to spend your life living like you trying to be resemblant of who you were before Christ? Why wouldn't you be all the more careful, all the more diligent to look for ways in which you could improve in your own life at honoring the Lord in light of all of this? And so we're to not be foolish when we have the complete word of God that dictates to us everything for living and, and honoring and pleasing Him. We have everything we need for life and godliness here. We have no excuse or reason to be foolish in how we live on this earth. Now, he says in verse 17, So then do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Now, let me just say that there's been much confusion about what the will of the Lord is. And people often ask, how can I find God's will for my life? Like it's some kind of mysterious thing. And certainly God has plans for all of us in the future that we don't know, a plan and a will for us that we'll go through in the future. So there's aspects of that that we won't know. But I hope to bring some clarity for you this morning in this regard because God's will is clearly laid out, his revealed will is clearly laid out in scripture. So in regards to God's will, it's first important that we understand that we, there's, there's aspects of it that we won't always know, but there's revealed will that we do know. And most of you, I got some of these points from MacArthur. He has a really good book on this called Found, God's Will. And, and whether you're struggling to know God's will for you or wrestling with that, I'd recommend that's a great resource. But here are a list of five things that you can be sure are God's will for you. One, God's will is that you be saved. This is in Scripture in 1 Timothy 2, 3 through 4. It says, This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. And by the way, if you're here this morning and you're not a believer, everything that I'm saying is not really going to be of benefit to you because you don't have the Spirit residing in your heart. You haven't been regenerated. And so you are not going to have the means by which to properly live out your life under the power and influence of the Spirit. And so... God's will for you, though, is that you be saved. This is what he desires, that you realize your sin, that, that you recognize your sin and, and that, you're, that Christ died for your sin and that you need to repent of that sin, but not only repent, for, repent of your sins, but turn to him and, and, and have him be exercise his lordship and mastery over your life, being involved in a good church, being around believers and seeking to grow in your understanding and knowledge of God. So if you're here this morning and you're an unbeliever, I just, I, I would encourage you to come to Christ to repent of sin and, 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 and so you can truly spend your time so that you can truly live in such a way that is pleasing and honoring to the Lord. Additionally, God's will is that you be spirit-filled. And we'll get into this later because it's in our text in the next few verses. And I'll go over this verse a little bit and unpack it in a minute. But Ephesians 5.18, it says, And do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. And so because I'm getting ready to go over that, I'm not going to spend much time on it here. But God's will for you is that you be filled with the Spirit. What does that mean? We'll get to it in just a moment. Thirdly, God's will is that you be sanctified. 1 Thessalonians 4.3, For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that is, that you abstain from sexual immorality. And of course, not just the sin of sexual immorality or impurity, but all sin. God's will is for you that you would grow in your sanctification, that you're regularly putting off sin and looking more and more like Christ each day, week, month, and year. That is God's will for you if you're a believer. God's will is that you be submissive. Both this is clear in the husband and wife relationship, but also as it relates to government and in authority structure. James 4, 7 says, Submit therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. So we, of course, understand the husband and wife role and principles of submission there. We understand the role in the government, but also practically for ourselves, we need to be submissive to God. We need to bring our, our desires and our will under subjection of, of his because what we will and what we desire is oftentimes tainted and intermingled with sin. And so we need to be submissive to the Lord, to him, to government, to parents, to authority. 
Now, fifthly, God's will is that you suffer. 1 Peter 3, 17 says, For it is better if God should will it so that you suffer for doing what is right rather than what, rather for doing what is wrong. James 1, 2 says, Consider it all joy, my, brother, my brethren, when you encounter various trials. God doesn't just inflict suffering on you simply to say, oh, that's my will. You got to go through that. No, God wants us to learn through that. Like in, as believers in James 1, 2, consider it all joy, my brethren. You're not considering it joy in the suffering itself. You're considering, what you're considering in the moment of whatever suffering or pain you're going through is that through this suffering, through this pain, I'm going to have the ability to look like Christ as I cling to him more tightly as I read how I should respond in this situation. So you're not rejoicing in the suffering itself. You're rejoicing in the opportunity that the suffering is going to bring for you as a believer to look like Christ to others who are watching and observing your life. And they say, wow, that's different. That person just lost a loved one. That person really just went through a very difficult time. And the way that I saw that person work through that, man, that's, that's amazing. I want to know the God that they serve. And you're doing this all for the glory of God. That's, that's the primary motivation. It's, I, I don't have much to say under this, just that as you're spending your time wisely, as you're carefully examining your walk, as you're understanding the will of God and seeking to please Him in all things, you're doing this all for the glory of God. That's the primary motivation, to please and honor our Savior. Now we'll get to the part of the filling of the Holy Spirit. This is the influence of the believer's walk on your outlines, be there. The influence of the believer's walk. One, the filling of the Holy Spirit. So, verse 18, Paul says, And do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. And just right off the bat, I just need to make a clarification because there's a lot of misunderstandings on what it means to be filled with the Spirit. Some people think that what it means to be filled with the Spirit is it's like a power pack or a supercharged, just a a bolt. God zaps me and bam, I've got the Spirit now and I'm just going to do all kinds of works and pleasing and honoring to Him. And so so it's kind of this mystical idea that they have of what it means to be filled with the Spirit. But that's not it. And we'll get to what it really is in just a moment. But other people, another misunderstanding though, is some people think, well, do, do I get more of, of this? Does, do some believers get more of the Holy Spirit than, the, uh, than other believers? No, that's also a false view. God equally grants us all the same Holy Spirit at the, at the, at when he regenerates us at the point of salvation. We have the Holy Spirit as believers fully, equally. It's just are we being influenced by the Spirit? So what does it mean to be filled with the Spirit? This is A, under that there on your outline, we're filled with the Spirit as we're controlled by the Spirit. So it's being filled with the Spirit. It's this idea of control, that you're allowing the Spirit to to dictate and control your life, that the Spirit empowers obedience to the principles and commandments of Scripture. And so we know that that's the case, that that's what it means, because it says in verse 18, do not get drunk with wine. For that is dissipation, and that whole idea there is that as you're controlled by wine or any kind of substance that alters your thinking, in that moment, you're completely consumed by that substance. And so in a similar way, as believers, instead of being drunk with wine or, or, or influenced by any other substance or anything or allowing anything to dictate our lives, first and foremost, we need to allow the Spirit of God to have control as we yield to Him of our, in and over our lives. So... Are you controlled by the Spirit on an ongoing basis? Are you seeking to bring your desires, your will, your affections, everything under subjection of God and asking that the Spirit would, would, um, would help you to live in a way that's pleasing to Him? And so another thing that's very important here is that you can't do anything that I've just been explaining to you without the help of God, without the work of the Spirit in your own life. So we need to constantly be controlled by the Spirit of God. And, and we just ask God for, for help as we do that. And that's our goal, is that we would, that we would be led by the Spirit as He provides insight, as we're, as, we're, as we're understanding Scripture. He's informing our minds, and, we, and He works, and He uses means, of course. We, we have good resources, we study, we, we think. There's nothing mysterious about what it means, again, but we're controlled by the Spirit so that we can properly live out the power of God in our lives. If we're, that's the only way that we're going to do that anyway. 
Lastly, see there the results of the believer's walk. So I'm going to read verse 19. It says, so he's just said in verse 18, don't get drunk with wine for that is dissipation. Be filled with the Spirit. And then he says in verses 19, and I'll read through 21, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father, and be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. So the results of the results of the believer's walk, here's one, one, biblical edification and encouragement to others. That's the first one there. There's biblical edification and encouragement to others, but there's also biblical worship through singing with others that goes on. Because it says in Ephesians 5, 19, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord. So in light of all that God has done, we show up to a place, for instance, for example, like this on Sunday morning, and we're regularly, as we're together as believers, we're providing encouragement to one another, and we're singing these wonderful words that are on, on, on the walls here of the melodies and of the music, because out of gratitude for what God has done, we want to, in response to him back, then properly properly honor him and give him the praise that he so richly deserves. And thirdly, a mutual thankfulness in the Lord with others. This is under the results of the believer's walk. A mutual thankfulness in the Lord with others. It says in Ephesians 5.20, always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father. So we're to be thankful in light of all that we've received from God. We're to be thankful, even as we approach this time of thanksgiving, really the world doesn't truly know what that means, but as believers, we can have a deeper sense of what we should really be thankful for. Most importantly, that we are in Christ and that he has drawn us to himself, that we have saving knowledge of the truth. We're to be, that is certainly one of the highest things that we have to be thankful for as we gather together with our families and share that on Thanksgiving even, to put that in your mind ahead of time to be thinking about just ways that you can share that you're thankful to the Lord with with your unbelieving family members or just with other believers in general. And fourthly, a desire to prefer the needs of others. It says there in verse 21, and be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. That is this idea that you're putting others' needs first above yourself as, as believers. You're not always just living as a believer for your own intended purposes, but you're considering the needs of others. You're, you're, you're anticipating the needs of others so that you can be a blessing and benefit to them. And so that's uh, a desire to prefer the needs of others is point four. And then number five, with a reverent heart towards God, it says, in the fear of Christ. Again, you're, you're carefully walking in such a way that's pleasing and honoring to him. You're doing this with a reverential awe and, and just in light of what God has done in your own life, you don't want to do anything that would displease your master. So these are the results of the believer's walk. So as we move towards communion, and the men can come forward at this time, just some qu- closing applicational questions for you. One, are you a believer this morning? If not, then... I pray again, my heart's desire is that you would truly come to Christ. And, and even as, we, as you have this time of reflection over communion, that you, might, that you might take this time to truly examine yourself. And if so, I pray that you would consider everything that, was just, uh, that, you, that we've just heard here in, in light of what you've just heard, that you may want to go away from here this morning in a way that's seeking to please and honor the Lord. Secondly, are you, are you paying careful attention to your daily conduct as a believer? Are you paying careful attention to your daily conduct as a believer? Third, are you properly managing God's time that he's graciously given you? Fourthly, are are you living the Christian life zealously doing good deeds for you or for the Lord? What's the motive? These are, again, just as we move towards communion, these are the things to be reflecting on, to be thinking through. Fifth, are are you striving to live out God's revealed will in, in Scripture? Are you seeking to grow in your knowledge and understanding of God? Are you controlled by the Spirit? Are you allowing the the Spirit to control and dictate every action, thought, word, and deed in your life as you read and come underneath Scripture in ways that are pleasing and honoring to the Lord? So at this time, we'll move to communion, and I guess, Paul, you can come on up.